We have Cinderella. She has bad blisters from the glass slippers. Beauty and the Beast. Our Beast is human again, but is coughing up fur balls. Goldilocks is seeing a psychiatrist for OCD. The Big Bad Wolf has asthma. Um, Ariel has amnesia. Pinocchio has a sinus infection. And Shrek a donkey, well, donkey supposedly caught his head on fire. Um, and then we have the doctor who is the head doctor at the hospital. Um, we're all in a hospital room. Um, all the characters besides Shrek and Donkey and Goldilocks are either sitting or standing in the room engaged in individual conversations. Mr. James Beast. Here he is. Now be very sweetie. Just tell them what happened and please try to control your temper. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> easy for you to say. I hope it's or easy for you to say. You are acting up the entire rug. <laughs> 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 oh my poor beastie, I hope he's going to be okay. Where's Papa when I need him? Hush up, girl. He's a beast. He can take care of himself. As for your Papa, I say grow up already. Some of us are trying to relax over here. We can't do that with all your yammering. Now, Grumpy, be nice. The girl's just scared. Don't worry about Grumpy, dear. He's not uh, Grumpy. <laughs> you know, You're not the only one with a man to worry about. I was having the time of my life at the ball. But at midnight, my feet hurt so bad, I had to leave and come here. If that's not all, I lost my other shoe on the way in out. TNF. TNF? Totally not fair. Duh. <laughs> Where have you been? Out in the woods? Is that why you're here? Culture shop get you. That's a lot coming from a chicken rags. What? <sighs> Are you kidding me? That stupid fairy godmother dress kit was so cheap. <laughs> Uh, can you get back to my problems now? My poor beastie is here all alone coughing up cat-sized fur balls, and there's nothing I can do to help him. I practically dragged him in here too. Last time I tried to nurse him, he almost bit my face off. <laughs> he has a pretty strong temper. Oh, how I wish Mrs. Potts was here. What is missing Potts? Mm, Mrs. Potts? She's our maid. Sweetest thing. Oh. But what is a cat? <laughs> it's a kind of animal. A pet you keep in your house? What's a... Oh, shut up already. Don't you know anything? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Leave her alone. She's got anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> now, Grumpy, relax. Just remember we're here to see Snow to keep her company and make sure she's okay. Well, it's one in the morning. I shouldn't sign up for this. I don't reckon I like that girl much anyway. All she did is cause problems. She nearly got us killed in that lightning storm. Nearly killed herself. Mm -hmm. And what's worse, she didn't let us eat unless we washed. You know, studies say if germs on your hands are ingested, one could get very sick. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened to me. After all, I am a real boy, a real growing boy, and I sure eat a lot. <coughs> what are your synonyms, boy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel so bad. I'm a good boy, really, but I got lots, I got the sniffles. <coughs> Hello there, how are you this evening? One, two, three, four, seven, eight. Oh, no, 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 this is not good. I make nine, that's an odd number. Oh, this won't do at all. Great, another whiny girl in the room. I attended sleeping in this crappy room while I wait for hours on end to see a sleeping girl, one who might not ever wake up. Let's not be so pessimistic. She could wake up. Perhaps if we go in and see her, she might sense her presence and wake up. Which presence? Pipe it. She got hit by lightning, for goodness sake. She should be dead. Why would we make such a difference anyway? This chair is too hard. Could somebody just hurry them up and check my feet? I should be next. They haven't even told me about my poor beast here. Why am I here again? I'm the youngest. I'm just a boy, a real boy. They should take me next. <laughs> Everyone? Stop breathing. The air is getting so thin in here, I can't even huff and puff and threaten you. <laughs> you must be allergic to whining brats or stupid girls or something. It's too hot in here. Hey, I would said that. I am just concerned for my well-being is all. BTW, it smells like super pumpkin-y in here. I didn't notice. All that matters is my poor beast. Doctor enters. Mrs. Bell, James is ready to see you now. Oh, my beastie! <laughs> 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 
One down, three to go. I can't believe we're all still waiting here. There's not even donuts to keep us from starving today. At least you have company to talk to. Phew, back to evens. OMG, this is getting ridiculous. I think I have some sausage and ham in my bag. Want some? No, I'm playing Angry Birds. Leave me alone. Die, pigs, die! <laughs> <laughs> you know, you really shouldn't eat that stuff. It's greasy and fogs your artillery. It probably doesn't help your wheezing much either. I'll take some. Takes a bite and spits it out. Yuck, that's too cold. I don't know how you can eat that stuff. It's just so totally inhumane. Killing an innocent pig. Pigs aren't innocent. They're all, they are dirty, like those good for nothing politicians. <coughs> they think they can live behind a little brick wall and they're totally untouchable. What's a poll station? Oh, can it, Ginger? Door slams open and Shrek and Donkey walk in, talking to each other about dragons and princesses from a video game they were playing. Oh, dear. I totally killed all the onion layers apart, man. I kicked that shorty farm boy's butt. The princess has her noble steed now. But then you had to go on a victory lap and jump on the couch and catch her stupid head on fire. You know you can't fly. I don't even know why you tried. Cause I believe! <laughs> Everyone else stops talking and looks at Shrek and Donkey. Ugh, not again! Come on, Donkey, we'll just have Fiona kiss it all better. Wings at Grumpy. <laughs> Door slams and silence fills the room. Grumpy smiles and puts away his cell phone and whispers to himself. <laughs> Oh yeah, happily ever after. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm going to read two poems that I wrote. Um, the first is Son of Man and the second is Woman with Crow. <clears throat> Temptation. It claws from the inside. In the beginning, it won. The fruit that hung just low enough to reach. It looked so sweet and innocent. Man with temptation today tries to hide by conforming, by looking as others do in a suit and hat. That green fruit sitting in front of his face. He tries to fight it, tries to run, but cons it consumes him to the core. Hunger takes control and a bite is taken away. Woman with crow. Hands with barely any flesh stroke the black creature. Night, she coos. Her cheek, so thin, rests on his head. Lips kiss, eyes close, shoulders hunch. Golden hair, fine as thread, escapes from its hold as night with soul and eyes stare. Thank you. Um, my first poem is Shattered. It's about the um, sh camp shooting in Norway. Laughter, fun, friends. Camp is made for things like these. Screams, shots, tears. Someone come and save us, please. Hide, my brain screams at me. Onto the rocks I climb for safety. Is this really how it has to be? Fear tears my heart apart. I want my mom. I text her. I want my home. I cry here. There's no safety. He came as an officer and began his war. Silence engulfs, is his war no more. He shoots on, they can't stop him. He shoots on, I can't tell how long it's been. I find comfort in my mother's words. The police are finally near. I see the helicopter searching the water for people here. I spot my rescue coming. I just want my family. I look toward people running. I finally reach home. Him. His anger is his joy, screaming tirades filled with threats, followed by laughter, laughter that cuts. His anger is his joy, giddily thrown fists, bruises flash to a smirking face. No pity here, no safety anywhere. His anger is his joy. Talks of fightings and beatings past, grins and giggling arise. No qualms about the pain he's caused. His anger is his joy. I wrote a short story about, a flash fiction short story about uh, a man I met in the mall once and he seemed really nice but then he got kind of weird. 
as often as the case. Oh yeah. I waited in the moving hallway as my girlfriend and her older sister searched the mall for new bras. I took a sip from a nearby drinking fountain and sat on a bench next to a man who looked as though he was in his late 80s. He had a Semper Fi veteran's hat resting on the top of his head and his fingernails looked overgrown. Like the baby boomer family had shed blood to raise, had forgotten about his basic needs. From some presupposed notion that all old veterans had nothing but sage-like advice stored up for a young, young, young and like me, I decided to ask him, to, I decided to thank him for his service. Thank you for your service, I said. Oh, I was just doing what we're all called to do, son. He was going to give his monologue about duty and service now. I knew he was going to. His eyes lit up, he licked his lips, and unfolded his dirty old hands like he was done blessing dinner. You should be a Marine. Oh, no thanks, sir. I'm actually in college right now. Well, they pay for your college now, you know. I actually have a full ride. Yeah, well, the Marines will pay it for you. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, I said. I looked around for my girlfriend and found a cell phone man heckling a middle-aged mom, a teenage girl filing her nails behind a department store counter, and the old man beside me looking down at the checkered tile floor. He managed, he managed an ornery grin. They'll give you a submachine gun now. You, one Marine could kill 15 men. He mimicked a shooting motion and began to spray invisible bullets all over the pretzel stand in front of us. <laughs> An elderly lady, her guide dog, and a display of soda cans were among the dead. <laughs> wow, I said. Warfare's really changed these days. Yep. A loud misbehaving kid on the level above us made a whistling noise, and the veteran turned around sharply to assess the present danger. Damn kids. He looked around like there was some place he was supposed to be, but couldn't remember where, or like the people that were supposed to come back for him were miles away. I think I see my girlfriend, I lied. Thanks again for your service and have a great day. He extended a tired right hand and shook mine firmly. You think about what I said, son. He unfolded and folded his slippered feet. You might not always have that pretty girl to come home to. Hi. Um, I'm Lacey Ramirez and I have two short poems for you today. The first one talks just a little bit about a family undergoing a little bit of financial difficulty. And the second one uh, talks a little bit about when my mother and father decided to cross the Mexican border to come over here to provide a future for me. So here's the first one. The sky is on fire. The sky is on fire. The earth underwater. Where is the air? Father's dinner waits cold. Mother chokes on paper. Smoke burns my eyes. We're all walking on wire. They chopped down the tree father planted with hope. The fat sparrow drowned while we yearned for water. I hate the color green. A mother's crossing. Six months pregnant, three more to go. Filled with doubt, filled with woe. Should I stay here in this land I call home? Think of her, he says. Oh, how she'll grow. Seven months pregnant, two more await. It's been how many days since I last ate? Fear of the rattles, fear of death. Think of her, he says. Let's change her fate. Eight months pregnant, one remains. Alone in a foreign world, I'm stuck in chains. Need to escape, losing my mind. Think of her, he says. Remember what she gains. Nine months pregnant, today is the day. Just when I feel my life start to decay, I hear her first cry, hold her in my arms. Look at her, he says. Now understand why we came all this way? My name is Rachel Moody, and I'm going to read a regular length short story. Um, I'm going to call it the fall of number 10. Friday nights were my favorite of the week. Dad took us to the slop trough, and we got a log of crispy critter onion rings swimming in spicy Sammy's mayo sauce. I always ate two heaping platefuls before the best part of the night, the burger we called Grandpa's chest clutcher. It was two patties, each a third pound grilled dead, mushrooms, onions, and all kinds of peppers sauteed in pig lard, two fried eggs, hickory smoked ham, two thick slices of cheddar, and two even thicker squares of pepper jack cheese melted on top of all that. <laughs> then there was the bun. You know when mom makes pretzels sometimes? That's what the bun was made out of, pretzel dough. It was browned just enough to have that shiny shell you can almost see your face in, and salted just enough to taste like the sweat dripping on your upper lip after you've been working in the midday sun for too long. 
Spread some of Betty Swanson's new churned butter on both sides. Slap on Mrs. Lloyd's jalapeno mayo and you got it. The best burger you could ever eat. Some people say it ruins it to squeeze on some ketchup, but I did it anyway. Mixed with Tabasco. I'd pick it up with my barn stained hands, squeeze it with my calloused fingers, and stuff as much as it, of it into my mouth as I possibly could. I used to anyway, not this Friday. Before reaching the bun, burgers are animals. They breathe, they eat, they have children, they live, and they die. I watched a burger die. I heard a burger die. It was Tuesday, and I had to spray the weeds on the farm. I don't mind spraying weeds. The backpack contraption they give me with a sloshy Agent Orange is heavy, but I am an exceptionally efficient weed assassin, especially when I have Jimmy Buffett and Alan Jackson giving me a beat to work to. The sun was out, and I was drinking it in with my thirsty white legs and bare arms. I had on an old dingy sleeveless t-shirt with my favorite Carolina blue basketball shorts. I would have worn my purple Converse as well, but weed killer isn't too kind of fabric, and my limbs don't always do what I tell them to. My long ponytail hung dusty and tangled behind me, wishing for a breeze. Jimmy and Alan were singing particularly well that day, and when I heard a cow join in, I chuckled to myself. I saw no reason for alarm. That is until the moo solo took on a desperate pitch, which she seemed a little too persistent for a common b conversation among bovines. I pulled out one of my lavender earbuds and found the screaming bowl. Bingo. Number 10 was wedged between two knee-high cement slabs. He must have been milling around with his buddies at the feeding trough when the crowd became too much for him, and he was squeezed over the side of the barrier. One cement border ran along the walkway I was spraying, and the other, spaced just under a cow width away, lined the feeding area. Number 10 was hose up, back nested in feces and pasty mud, mooing, crying out for his life. Rumbles in my stomach had told me lunch was a good idea mere minutes before, but looking at number 10 now fomented a gastric revolt. A legion of flies surrounded his struggling body. The veins in his eyes shot streaks of red through the bulbous orbs as they bulged to escape their sockets. His head ricocheted between the ground and the cement with each jerky attempt to wrench free of his concrete prison. I dialed help on my phone as quickly as my trauma-numbed fingers could move. Hello? Hi, there's a cow stuck in between the cement slabs by the feeding trough and he's mooing really loudly. I don't know how to help him. Okay, we're on our way, but we're about a half hour out. All right, what can I do? There's nothing you can do, really. We'll get there as soon as we can. Maybe check on him every once in a while. Okay. I choked back tears as I hung up. My hands were shaking, my legs quivering with adrenaline I couldn't put to use. The hair on my neck and arms collected globes of sweat as they stood at attention in waves over my skin, responding to the piercing moves. I took measured steps toward number 10. I wanted to help, to run to his side as his able rescuer, all five feet and four inches of me, all 110 pounds of me, but better go slow behind the lines of enemy flies. The soles of my worn shoes flapped as I walked, slapping the faces of renegade dandelions. Near enough for the stench of the excrement and sloppy mud to crawl into my nostrils, I tried to my best to console him. It's okay, number 10. Help is on the way. It's all right. You're going to be okay. I only half believed what I said. His stupid cow friend stood with glassy eyes, as useful as the gas station Slim Jims and packages of teriyaki Oberto they were soon to become. Eventually, he was a sacrifice. They were, evidently, he was a sacrifice they were willing to make. A fellow soldier just thrown into the trenches, heartlessly decimated. When I walked near him, they spread away as if placing the responsibility on me to free him. As soon as I drew back, they sucked in to view him better. I hated those cows. Cowards, I shouted and turned away. <laughs> I couldn't stay to watch number 10 plead with his unmoving friends. I made my way across the field to spray along the side of the road. My feet crushed a few unassuming clusters of clover as I walked. It was hot, really hot. As soon as I reached the grass, I took off my nearly solo shoes, staining my hands with the remnants of bruised stems and torn leaves. The blades of grass were sun scorched and revolted against the pressure of my feet, stabbing through my unmatched socks. Callous toes and heels became my armor. My back was turned to number 10, but I knew he was still there, still battling for life with his moose, tearing through on Jackson's baritone, singing Angels Cried. I had hoped help could reach him in time, but when a sharp prick of pain seared through my ankle just above the choking elastic of my sock, my hope wavered. I could count the number of times I had been stung by a bee on one, one finger before that day. Then I realized number 10 had stopped mooing. Help finally crunched up the gravel drive in a dust-spattered Ford. He clunked out of the truck and jaunted over to number 10. The flies buzzed a chorus of anticipatory glee as the help lifted number 10's head, then dropped it. His neck had all the strength of an overcooked noodle, and his head slapped back down in his neck had all the strength of an overcooked noodle, and his head slapped back down in the muck. 
Mr. Help kicked number 10 a few times with his steel-toed boot, like a doctor might tap a knee for a reflex, but the cow had nothing left to give. How long has it been since he stopped mooing? About 20 minutes, I said, hoping that didn't mean much. Hmm, well, he's probably not going to make it. He said it so callously, so matter of fact. I went back to the road in disbelief. Just spray the weeds, back and forth. He'll be okay. This has happened before, five times before. No cows have ever died. He'll be fine. In 25 years, no cows have died. I tried to reassure myself with what I had heard the help say. My pocket buzzed. I pulled out my phone to read number 10's fate. Sometimes I picture my burgers with cement slabs for buns, feces and mud for mayonnaise, and live cow for patties. Well, mostly live. Friday nights just aren't the same anymore. I watched Grandpa's chest clutcher die. Saw his eyes, eyes bulge, distressed moose tear from his overextended throat, his lolling tongue searching for some semblance of the word help. Before reaching the bun, burgers are animals. Number 10, that was his name. My first poem is called Second Place, and it's about my birth story, pretty much. One mother, two babies, three blood-sharing hearts, four hours of tears and sweat, five loved ones wait in agony, six doctors fill the hospital room, fit for one bed, seven hours of rolling film, eight minutes apart, nine centimeters dilated, 1008, hello, second place. Okay. Okay. And this, is, this one's called Whispered Voices. We talked until the dew dropped from the morning, appeared like a bee on a chrysanthemum. We talked until our promises were forgotten memories, like echoes in a dense cave. We talked until the fire burned away the chill, like washed away snow on a sunny day. We talked until our voices became raspy, like someone screaming for the first time. And this one's called Summer Wishes. Sticky popsicle fingers, tie-dyed tongues, grass-stained jeans, sun-bleached skin, chlorine-soaked hair, bare feet cartwheel parade, barefoot cartwheel parade, and muddy puddles from the fallen sky, speckled kiss sunsets, midnight wishes upon shooting stars, simply innocent, truly magical. All right, so I wrote a play on the Shakespearean fools. Uh, we have Nick Bottom from Midsummer Night's Dream. He's a weaver turned actor. Dogberry from Much Do About Nothing, and he's uh, kind of a watchman. Festy from Twelfth Night, and he's just a witty fool, basically. John Falstaff from the Henry Plays. Um, <laughs> he's a comrade to Prince Henry. And then there's Desdemona uh, from Othello, and she's the wife of Othello. And the setting is a bar <laughs> next to the Globe Theater. Enters Bottom. Good morrow, my audience of the evening. It is my duty to present to you a fine tale of love, passion, and mystery. That is, assuming everyone involved remembers their part. First, I should like to introduce the good Peter Quince. Hey ho, Peter Quince! Snug, flute, snout, startling. Where are those players? No matter, indeed. I can play their parts. Anything for the show, you know. I must on all the roles and be a true performer. No man has ever defeated such a task before. Now, good man, you would turn down the lights, I shall begin. Enters Dogberry. Ho! Oh, who goes there? Why, you are not one of my performers, nor do you have any part in the play. But would you be so lofty and join me in this endeavor to present my tale? That is not the question I required after. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it is I, Nick Potter. Well, good neighbor, God has blessed you with a, well, awfully name resembling parts of the human autonomy. However, <laughs> <laughs> no matter, you seem to me to be a good man, fine and true. You will do, since I have lost my previous watch guards, they having made the discovery of the, the false talking and showing and gave a banding off themselves. Yes, you will do. I... We'll do it. I knew that you would be your answer. Good man. <laughs> I grant you, sir, I would make a fine yard. That is not my purpose tonight. I must get this play underway. Why be a performer when you could be the prince's watch, one of the most senseless and fit job ever offended a man? <laughs> <laughs> I will not join your mad crew of watchmen. Now get up, my play is late and started. Enters Festi. Peace, arguing fellows. What causes the fire to be so hot this evening? 
<laughs> Who are you? I am the fool. That's a suited name. <laughs> I doubt that it's your true name, and if it is, that's rather unfortunate. You may call me Fest, if you choose. It appears that you desire some portable order. Now, what remedy may I propose for you? It is nothing a fowl can fox in so little a time you seem to have, and that we have. Come, bottom fellow, take no note of this man called fool. <laughs> did you catch what he said? I grant you, friend, I did not. He is a man of great works and no comprehension. Words and no comprehension. I'm um, a man of great works and no compensation? Not necessarily. <laughs> Bards do little work with great monetary compensation. Dogberry opens his mouth to respond. No matter what service can I provide, what quandary can I answer? No fool of your sort can provide me with a sustainable watchman. I may appear as a fool, but my mind is sharp. Do tell me the situation. A fool of mind or a fool of no mind matters not, and I am mere well to leaving with my own body and my own body only. Better a witty fool than a foolish wit. But I am an ass! <laughs> <laughs> Hush, you two, enough! Do you not see that my play is ruined and my rehearsal worth nothing? My audience is gone! Enters Falstaff. Not quite. There is still one, and I see nothing is being solved in this manner. Here, bottom fellow. Hands bottom and sword. I have heard of you. You are the prince's devilish companion, John Falstaff. I am no more of that than you are the king's dim-witted fool. Now you are exactly who I am, who I am looking for. Take sword from bottom. Huh, me? A man of your stature. Get off my stage, you three. I must start my play even without the other actors. This I... Go for it. Oh, we'll be one of your actors, Nick Bottom, in light of your empty stage. So long as there is a part for a fool, I will play the dashing swordsman who gets the glory. But that's my part! <laughs> Enter Desdemona. Everyone freezes. Well, hello, my fine lady. <laughs> <laughs> I need your help. She surely does, and at what cost? <laughs> oh, such a beautiful player! Perfect for the part of the fairy queen. I'd be glad to. Now, let me introduce you to our cast. We have Bottom Fellow, Nick Bottom. <laughs> me lady, would you honor me? He is obsessed with this play, which is an hour late and five minutes short. Then we have a drunken bandit. <laughs> <laughs> John Falstaff at your service. I am not as she says. I am a noble, loyal swordsman of the king. Just a moment pulls away from his drunken breath. Don't mind him, he's broke. <laughs> I am not. Someone else will pay my bill. And this fellow is a watchman looking for a crew. I believe he said he was an ass. A what? <laughs> Please, I don't have time for this. My name is Desdemona. My husband is going to kill me, and I need someone strong. Sees Dogberry with the sword. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and brave, and who will protect me? I have been assassined to the prince's watch. I am beginning, I am searching men of honesty to join me. I cannot help you now. Who is this husband you speak of? <laughs> a fellow, the highly respected general in the Venetian army. I am much too drunk to be of service. <laughs> <laughs> what is honor and bravery to a living man, anyway? Glory is reserved for those who die in battle. I thought you said you were a noble swordsman. Will you help me? I am nothing more than a court jester, not a military man willing to challenge such as your husband. You are a fool, then. My lady is a fool, and I can prove it. Who is a fool would search for valor in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I, Nick Bottom, will rescue this fair maiden, for I alone have been chosen as talented enough for the part. I will defeat the foe and all the audience so that all will be perched on the edge of their seats in anticipation. What are you thinking, Bottom? Man is a patched fool, if you will offer to say what his thoughts are, eh? I will have Peter Quince write a ballad about this beautiful maiden. Yes, and I will have him call it Bottom's Dream. <laughs> I'm sure he will do wonders. Take sword from Dogberry and pokes Bottom in the side. <laughs> you, you fools. <laughs> my play is ruined, my audience gone, and now I've lost my beautiful fairy queen. Come, bottom fellow, you have been chosen for the prince's watch. This is your charge. You are to beat any man who stands near the prince's window. You are to make no noise in the streets. On ward, neighbor! <laughs> bottom allows himself to be dragged away. A beer, please. Charge it to the fool. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jenna Harbeck, and for my first poem, 
We had an assignment to write a ballad about um, a headline that we found in a tabloid. And so for my first poem, it's called Fountain of Youth Found in New York City's Subway Toilet. <laughs> the fountain of youth is often sought by those who want a perk. They store in their cupboards the treasures they bought, but cosmetics never work. They search high and low and everywhere for that very special stream. Just when they think they can't longer bear, some hope comes to their dream. For New York City's subway station, in a very unlikely spot, they find, in their, hi they find their highly hidden fountain where people pop a squat. <laughs> Not in a bench, a seat, or a chair, or a place you'd soon forget. No, the fountain of youth, if I may dare, is in a subway stop toilet. Don't ask me how this refreshing spring arrived in this disgusting place, but if you need a healing zing, you must immerse your face. <laughs> this might not be what you'd expect, but please try not to be girly. The way to relieve age defects is to give yourself a swirly. <laughs> no matter what fills that toilet bowl, the fountain will still remain. Come waste or vomit or any soil, the changes will be the same. So if you desire that youthful look, come at the crack of dawn. Get out of your clean, tidy nook and plunge in that subway, John. <laughs> And my second poem is an ode to early mornings. You rope these little weights to my lids, now impossible to open. You paint, you, you paint strong gray circles beneath my eyes. Call it luggage, but what am I packing for? Early mornings, I never invited you in. I could only greet you with a gravel-filled voice. I swallow rocks and grunt like a smoker who just had to have a kick at dawn. Goodness, early mornings, look what you've done to my hair. You ran your eager hands through my once straightened locks, ruffled it, and swirled it. I dare you to crawl under these sheets. I'll roll over to make room just for you. This pocket of heat you feel, Blankets and I have worked as a team to create it. It's safe in here, and you can be a part of it, as if all the covers and pillows have swallowed you up, one big cotton candy cradle. Be adventurous and share this moment so that when your nemesis called sleeping in comes, he will climb between the blankets and make us three. Some way will make this work. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm going to read some poetry, I guess. <coughs> louder. Oh, louder. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I got one here called Sometimes. Sometimes I am startled out of myself, and it's annoying. I collect teeth and knuckles, hair and toenails in a linty pile on the cold kitchen linoleum, spit on my palms and start patting handfuls of the stuff in clumps across my arms and chest. There's always a little extra, though, each time. That, I kick under the fridge. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, my next one's called The Poor Bastard that, that Flogged Christ. The verbs dripped red from the leather lines, bundled in a calloused fist with white knuckle punctuation. Even though stanza means room. Expletive stumbled through grimacing lips as the poet again rose the tangle of words. It's only a job. Um, I've got another one from back home. There's a place we all hung out called Three Tree Point. That's what this one's called. <clears throat> the bottles pile up and clink off one another like the words that linger long, lazy lines from our salt-laced lips. The tide will erase the bonfires. For now, we'll skip bottle caps across the breakers and lift our necks, defy the sinking moon. And I've got one more for you guys called Things That My Father Taught Me. To catch a pop fly, transfer the red stitched hide to my right hand and throw out countless imaginary runners trying to score from second. Never swing first, to lead with my left and keep power stored in my back leg, to drive it through my hips into a right hook. More than these, to get back up when his milk gallon gloved fists were faster than mine. Thank you. And I am going to be reading a flash fiction for you guys tonight. Um, so it's a short one, and it's called Useless Things. Am I too quiet? I'll be louder. <laughs> okay. A cat has 32 muscles in each ear. The jaundiced woman's eyes stared intently, then roamed towards the ceiling with a distant gaze. A thin hand fingered the arm of a girl just graduated from high school. The nurse left the room with an empty syringe. Slow croons from Sinatra were sliding down the hallways as fast as the stuffy, breezeless air would allow. The young girl cleared her throat quietly and shifted in the creaky folding chair. Would you like to go for a walk today? There was a quiver in the last word. 
Only 8% of the air we breathe is oxygen, came the raspy reply. The girl wondered what her mother would do if she was sitting in this chair, feeling helpless and trapped. In this claustrophobic room, the walls were tightening, and something desperate was building up inside her stomach. There is no word in the English language that rhymes with purple. The woman's toneless voice only added to the weight. Rubber bands last twice as long when refrigerated. Now that sounded just like her mother, the girl thought, always looking for a way to save a dollar, putting too much thought into the useless things until it was too late. Can I get you something to drink, she asked, more to break the constant flow of information than politeness. The woman was silent, her eyes gazing at the plum and chocolate striped wallpaper in front of her. Both of them sat motionless, the heavy tick of the clock wearing away the determination in the back of the young girl's mind. In her daydream, she stood up, smashed the clock with her throbbing fists, and screamed until her voice was just as raspy as the woman's. Peanuts are one of the 300 ingredients in dynamite. She blinked. A nurse entered the room without knocking. She held a glass of juice and a stethoscope. The nurse knelt down and felt the woman's forehead with the back of her palm. How does your mother seem to be doing today? The girl stood up silently, sliding out of the room and into the icy winter air. This poem is called The Angel Experiment. The pressure in my chest won't loosen its talons, but my body already knows what to do. Muscles constrict, heart pumps, blood flows, flight. Rooftops fall away into nothing as I soar among cathedrals, spires of the sky, racing upward through hazy fields of white, weightless, joyful. And this next one's called Equal, and it's about marriage. Danger, danger, they have your cage prepared, the sideshow freak to attract the nation. You'll be on display for months, while sharks crawl past your prison bars, smelling your defeat, their favorite bouquet. Your husband smiles at you before facing the crowd, explaining how special his wife is. Eden's gnawing at the ropes that bind her, blood in the water. And my first poem is about um, us longing for love, but forgetting that um, God gives us all we need. So, I forget. Parched, but afraid to ask for a drink. It's stored inside my body in a secret wineskin, ready to linger with longing. I need some way to quench my thirst, but I forget that I'm saturated. So I search for a drip when I already have a waterfall. Um, and this next one is pretty self-explanatory, and all the names in here are real. <clears throat> Celebrities' children. When people ask, what's your name? I have to say, Petal Blossom Rainbow. They ask, are you playing a game? No, I promise. I even know a tomorrow. Sometimes I go on to say, my siblings have weird names too. They respond, no way. It's true. Their names are Poppy Honey, Buddy Bear Maurice, and Daisy Boo. <laughs> I think about others such as Sunday, True, and West. I wonder if their mothers thought those were the best. Out of the million, millions they could have cho cho choose, sorry, that was bad. Out of the millions that they could choose, like Jessica Paul or even Joe, they pick Coco Apple and Poet Sienna Rose. I ponder, where did their brains go? <laughs> Others include Kalel, Satchel, and Audio Science. What can cause this lapse of brain function? Do they just want an audience? Maybe it was an act of compulsion. And finally, one more for fun, Sage Moonblood. While many people think these names are quite wild, they are very common in Hollywood. Alas, it's the price we pay to be a celebrity's child. <laughs> My first poem is called In the Palm of My Hand. Ooh. If I were in charge of the world, I'd give out free spoons, bags of tea, cruiser bikes, and pairs of toms. If I were in charge of the world, there would be racial peace, tire swings, and cars that run on garbage. If I were in charge of the world, 
You wouldn't have to worry about money. You wouldn't have to. Be you wouldn't have to conform to social norms or hear gas prices went up. If I were in charge of the world, free houses would be a trend on the market. All concerts would be free, and all country music would be erased, forgotten, and destroyed. <laughs> if only I were in charge of the world. <laughs> My second one is called Adam. I have been studying the difference between solitude and loneliness. A trivium of knowledge anchoring down in the harbor of complaints about love, researched hate and the science of triumph. Iron and wood keep me grounded, while the white walls collect harlequins, canaries, Antwerp, and bottles of wine. I have been studying the difference between solitude and loneliness, only to discover that ships may be sinking. Um, I wrote this play. It, it's titled Mormon Stew in your handout, but it's actually um, it's a well-balanced meal, so enjoy. <laughs> okay, Claire and you and I are in the kitchen preparing dinner. Eating and chopping the meat in small cups for soup. Um, a husband is off dating and will join the ladies in later in the scene. Do you think he'll know? You know what, Clara? It's not funny, Eden. He won't know. He can't know. We did everything we could to, uh, get rid of her. Maybe we should wash our clothes again. Should I shampoo the rug? I think twice is enough, Clara. Clara, stop washing. What do we talk about when Ray gets home? We will talk like normal wives talk to their husband on normal days. Normal wives, Clara. Okay, normal. So, um, how's the soup coming along? Just as good as I thought it might. It's a good bone for making broth. Can't believe that skinny broad could produce such a bone. <laughs> Maybe we should call her parents and thank them for her genetics. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> smells delicious. Sure does. So, what should we tell him the meat is? I wonder what it tastes like. Should we try some first? Sure, I guess. Should I wait for That's probably a good idea. Raw meat can make you sick. You think this meat can make you sick? Like how chicken does? I think it probably could. Why are you even thinking about that? I was just wondering if it makes you sick or not. You might be poisoning our husband. We are not going to be poisoning him. Do you think I look good as a blonde? Seriously? Do you know how much fat is in this soup? Nope. Okay. I think I should lose some weight, like 20 pounds at least. You don't need to look like her. What time is it? Five past five. Okay. Riley should be how many minutes? Do a run through of the house to make sure everything looks normal. Right. On it. Hey, honey. How was your day? Oh, hey. It was great. Eventful, but great. Eventful? What were you ladies up to? Just the normal things, you know, we always do. Like vacuuming, dishes. Oh, we shampooed the carpets today, and... Um, Made this dinner. Sounds fun. <laughs> yep, sure was. So where are my other two beauties? Clara is wandering around here somewhere, and I haven't seen Lisa all day. Hey, Clara, have you seen Lise? Hi, love. I haven't seen Lisa all day. <laughs> hmm, maybe I'll call her cell. Are we meeting her from the other room? Do you hear that? I hear her ringing. Is that her phone? Maybe she left it here on accident. She's probably at her parents' place or something. Too bad they don't have a phone. Yeah, she's probably there. It's just so weird she didn't talk to anyone. Yeah, weird. Well, <laughs> well, anyways, what's for dinner? Soup. What kind of soup? It's a surprise, my love. Oh, all right. It's a done together to eat dinner. Well, shall we pray? <laughs> Lord, bless this food and this family. Keep us safe from harm. <laughs> Keep us healthy and free from sin. <laughs> Keep us happy and together. <laughs> Lord, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for all that we have. Amen. Clara, why so giggly tonight? Sorry, I just have a case of the giggles. Maybe you should learn to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> the soup is to die for. Good work, ladies. Did Lisa help before she left? You could say that. <laughs> yeah. She helped quite a bit. She was part of the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you.
poems for you guys. Um, the first one, I was just having a lot of fun with like sensory, cool images. Um, we had to choose a line from a different poem, and that's what I started out with. So this one's called Essence. We smell mortality on certain people as they pass. Self-absorption, musty and mildewed as, di as dish towels stuffed into the back kitchen drawer. Limp strings of spaghetti still clinging to the fibers. Bitterness is pointed, sharp as a wedge of Italian grana, hard at the corners because somebody forgot to cover it. Envy reeks of rotten eggs, clogs our nostrils, blue mold lurking under each tired eye. And sadness is that overwhelming blend of shrimp and boiled tuna leaking out of the fish processing plant down the road. Each briny drop corrodes one more centimeter. Okay, and my other one is called Deer Claws, which I realize could sound Christmassy. Um, but there's a statue of a giant clothespin by an artist named Claus Oldenburg, and so I based this off of that. Dear Claus, you boasted of the ordinary, a clothespin to squeeze the sacred details together. I imagine your house, blue and white striped rubber bands looped inside picture frames, a jar of thumbtacks where exotic flowers might have been, popsicle stick placemats on the table, shoelaces tying back the simple curtains. Your children always knew that each dandelion they picked you would sit in a tin can on your office desk until it wilted. So I tried to make a really serious Bible verse funny and it wound up being really bad so I made it serious. Uh, so it's about Lazarus and I always kind of thought it was kind of funny like when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead he doesn't say anything. It's like, if I get raised from the dead after three days, like, be like, what just happened? <laughs> but he doesn't say that. But, so I kind of went from the angle of a lot of the times in the Bible there's a lot that isn't said, and a lot of the times that's just as important. So that's the direction I took it in. And this poem's called Lazarus. Jesus wept. The only miracle bigger than a resur resurrection was the God who showed humanity. Lazarus, come out. His bones rose and came to the light, which was the glory of God. He shuffled over to the one that set him free and said nothing. His serious face looked as though it was trying to articulate what he'd seen the last three days. But he stood wrapped up in the linen and the wild air and considered the things left to say. Uh, my first poem is Curious. I eat questions for breakfast and drown them in orange juice. But still they linger, gripping my mind like a gecko on the ceiling. They roll down my tongue and launch into the crisp air like a diver into water. Does it matter if a moose has whiskers? Or if an African town is in danger of becoming the next Pompeii? Like a salty sea gust, they barge in, bringing twigs and string, building a nest that can never be removed. Uh, my second one is actually called Warning. Um, it is um, rolls of yellow caution tape, bright enough to attract the hummingbirds, doesn't hedge my life. If it did, the evening my parents lost me by the river might have had a thousand goldfinches singing in the trees. Why can't they notice us leaving cameras? We don't want the police seeing us leaving at the same time they die. Don't forget the gun. I'll get that. You get your purse and my wallet. So how do we get out of here? Housekeeping! Out the window. <laughs> <laughs> they climb out the window moments before the housekeeper lets herself in. The housekeeper comes to herself and begins cleaning. She smooths out the cover on the bed, lazily dusts for a moment, and takes a look at the bloody rug before shrugging and flipping it over. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll take one after a nap. 